we're starting the last segment, um, which is a dialogue with Tom McCarthy. Hi, Tom. Hello. Tom is a novelist and essayist whose work has been translated into more than 20 languages. His first novel, Remainder, won the 2008 Believer Book Award and was recently adapted for cinema. His third novel, C, was a 2010 Booker Prize finalist, as was his fourth, Satin Island, in 2015. He's currently a fellow at the DAD residency program here in Berlin, and we're really lucky to have him. Thank you. So we thought we would start with Satin Island because it brings up a lot of weird things. Specifically, we both noticed that the term so fucking strange and the word weird recur a lot in the novel. Just to set it up for any horribly unlucky person who hasn't read it, um, the narrator of Satin Island is an anthropologist named Yu, as in the letter U. He's an anthropologist who doesn't work in the typical um, field um, outside the inside of ethnography, but he's embedded within a corporation where he's an internal ethnographer. Eventually, he's tasked with compiling something called the Great Report, also known as the Kube Sassen Project, I believe. Uh, and he is um, in, meant to decode the workings of contemporary culture at large, as well as the internal workings of this company. So Yu's hero is Claude Lévi-Strauss, the French anthropologist who's known for developing structural anthropology, which is the idea that structures of society and culture have um, patterns or codes that you could uncover through studying the primitive other. Um, we've been talking this evening about first contact narratives and anthropology presents us with a particular case study for how first contact has been um, constructed and performed um, not only outside humanity but within. So I thought we would start with a um, short passage from the book. Let me just say it's really good to be here um, always at HKW and, and when you invited me I was kind of resistant because I, I don't speak as um, a member of the new weird at all. I've never even read um, I've never even read Lovecraft, and, uh, and I don't even speak about the new weird, but, but when we talked, you know, I realized, as Jim talks as well, I realized that yes, I guess I am dealing with these things. So anyhow, I'll just read the passage. But then so is, we should talk about this, so is Kafka, right? I mean, <laughs> looking at yourself from outside is what the borough's about. It's what Proust's about too. I mean, that, you know, this, this must be said also. It's all weird. So, um, so here's a bit where, where you is um, talking about the problem of not weird enoughness versus too weirdness. Because when an anthropologist has decoded a tribe, he loses his interest because their mystique has gone. But then if they're too weird, you've got no purchase on them either. So there's some kind of golden place in the middle. Um, okay. Um, Having encountered endless tribes who aren't strange enough, tribes who, once decoded, lose all their mystique, my hero finally alights far up some river on a tribe so fucking strange he can't make head or tail of them. This exasperates him too. Incomprehensible is no better than banal. It's just its flip side. But maybe, just maybe, he reasons, somewhere in between these two extremes, in between understanding so completely that an object's robbed of its allure on the one hand and on the other not understanding anything at all, there might be some ambiguous instances in which the balance is just right. These instances, he tells us, would be godsends. They'd provide us with the very reasons or excuses for our own existence. Beautiful. Thanks. Um, it occurs to me that the, um, the incomprehensible versus the banal is actually very similar to what I was talking about back at the beginning of the evening about the total banality of um, science fiction versus the incomprehensibility of fantasy, which is not to be explained at all. And it seems like this passage just gets at so many of these um, 
in between spaces we're trying to talk about tonight, um, these ambiguous instances. So I'd like to ask you why the figure of the anthropologist was the right one to tackle the in-between with. Um, and I know you've also um, mentioned, written somewhere, that the anthropologist in some ways for you was a stand-in for the figure of the writer. Oh, totally. I mean, the, so the founding kind of father of anthropology, Bronisław Malinowski, his first commandment is just write everything down. So anthropology is an exercise of turning the world into a text, which is an act of interpretation, which is kind of gnostic in a way. I mean, you know, there's something mis mystical about it. You, you look at, the, at this swirling mass and you, and you translate it into some kind of Bible. Um, and and um, so, so it's a kind of li literary act. And then in classical anthropology, of the type that Levi Strauss is kind of pretty much the last practitioner of and the destroyer of, he, you know, it's alien encounter. You go to the jungle, you meet the other, you decode them, you write the book on them. Um, but then post Levi Strauss, of course, we, we are the aliens, you know, that then anthropologists look at the streets of Paris, Michel de Certo, Roland Barthes, and, and so on. You get kind of, that, that's where structuralism ends up. The alien is us. And also with, with capitalism, there's a complete collapse. So actually, my character being a corporate anthropologist is not unusual. More than 50% of anthropology graduates post-1980 work in the corporate sector. And like 30% work for the government. Yeah, 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 exactly. So so there's this, and this was interesting too, because it, it, it kind of shows the relation between, between art and power, basically, between cultural vanguards or avant-garde, between, between intellectuals and, and power, you know, that they're not outside artists are always deeply implicated within, you know, within the order of, of, of power. But there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of collapse there. I mean, so, so my guy, my hero, he got famous writing a, a book about clubbing culture in the 90s. And, and then he, he finds himself like taking drugs, passing out in some club. And he's saying, well, am I outside? Am I inside? Is this research? Am I pretending to be, am I pretending not to be what I'm pretending to be? I mean, this this kind of kaleidoscope of personae and identities that just shatters and there's this, this kind of, you know, um, almost psychosis, which is his praxis, in which, in which some kind of subject on the outside looking in just dissolves that, that kind of 19th century novelist or tw early 20th century anthropologist position just is untenable. Right, the field in many ways is um, academia's um, construction of the weird outside that tries to be explained and then this horrible inversion that uh, was bound to happen happened um, in which the observer and the observed and the field versus the home base completely collapsed. And so you do have this kind of um, psycho psychological reckoning um, at a certain point in history that is also described in the book. Um, Something that you, the character, uh, <laughs> the character you um, becomes fascinated with in his attempt to compile the great report is an oil spill that he uh, sees on television at an airport very close to the start of the book. Um, and the oil spill, um, along with a few other motifs like a parachute diver, um, he sort of tries to work into this um, like pattern recognition project. Um, and of course the, the fact that there is no pattern becomes part of what's making him, uh, <laughs> making him lose it. Um, but I wanted to talk about the oil spill, partially because it's a clear hyper object in relation to what we were talking about earlier. Um, this thing that just can't be comprehended because the scale of destruction is so large and because you can't understand it by seeing an image of it or by touching it, it it's incomprehensible in, on a perceptual level. Um, so on one level, I think it's about this scale problem and perceptibility and not being able to find patterns, but it's also about matter and the resistance of matter to interpretation. Do you feel like the, um, the oil spill is about irreducibility or do you feel like it's about the possibility for signification? Well, kind of both. Um, you've got some pictures of oil, right? I mean, the, the, he, he just stares. The thing about the oil spill is it's like the car crash for Ballard. That, it, it's not an event that happens and then is over. It's this continual thing that's always happening. There's always an oil spill somewhere, and there's always going to be another one. It's like one continual, slowly un unrolling 
disaster. But, but, but I guess my guy becomes fascinated with the formal qualities of it, like the way oil kind of takes other shapes, the way it coats objects like fish or rocks, it turns them into sculptures, into kind of heroic forms of themselves, like a bird covered in oil is almost like a sculpture of a bird, which is it's almost like better than a bird because it's more, you know, it, it's already in that kind of tragic, heroic mode. It becomes mode. like an archetype of a bird. It becomes an archetype of a bird. or a, I mean, also the sense that oil is the archive. I mean, there's nothing unnatural about oil. I mean, oil is dinosaurs and trees. It is the Benjaminian archive of, of the earth, right? Kind of un, unfolding and becoming legible. And he has these fantasies of it, of it becoming vinyl. And, and if only if you could put a needle onto it and play it, then somehow, you know, the history of, of a, at a kind of planetary level would suddenly sing in this like kind of Holderlin light, light way. Um, so another kind of decoding this thing that's resistant to spinning out it, meaning. It, it's the it's the possibility of forms, and it, and it, and it's in its mutability, it kind of eludes any um, any formal designation. It's exactly what Stephen Dedalus says about the polluted beach in Ulysses. It's this kind of Proteus figure. It's like it, it, you're you're trying to read it, and it invites reading, but but can never quite quite be read. I guess the last thing about the oil spill. I think you had a picture here. The um, no, it's gone. Oh, it's all gone. The the idea that um, it's, it's he, he becomes kind of obsessed with this moment of oil hitting a oh maybe it's not there. Oil hitting a snowy coastline, like when the black of the oil hits the white of the coast and stains it. For him, that's that's the moment of writing. So writing is not kind of refining the world into some concept in this kind of whatever idealist Hegelian way. It's 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 mess. It's a it's a pollution. It's a a staining, um, you know, a formless kind of m marking. Of right. Something. Well, what's so powerful to me about the idea of an oil spill as an act of inscription is partly because it's eerie, because what is the agent writing? Right, so there's, there's, who is this non-human agent, right? It's this idea of there's something present where there should be an absence or it's vice versa. It's an inhuman writing. It's an yeah. inhuman writing, yeah. and at the same time, the human is incapable of not wanting to read it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, right. Th this is the, I mean, at both ends, of the, at the material end and at the kind of super elaborate structural end, the world is writing itself. So the world is writing itself through oil, and the world is writing itself through digital capitalism. I mean, he realizes you don't need an anthropologist or a novelist to map the networks of kinship because Facebook's doing it and Amazon's doing it. And every time you click on anything, it's correlating what you like with what people you know like. I mean, that's networks of kinship right there. The map is being, right. you don't need a novelist to do that. So, so at both ends of the scale, yeah, writing is, is, is happening in a totally inhuman way, a subhuman and a superhuman way. Right. So the writer's task then is just to kind of N negotiate their own redundancy and, and maybe just to, 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 to acknowledge in a Burkean way the, the awesomeness of this, of this, you know, of this process. Right, and the redundancy also being that if the task of writing were to decode, that also, you know, the human can't do that best. And if decoding is impossible, then the task of writing has to be something else. Yeah, I mean, he has this, you know, and this is where mysticism comes in. I, mean, I think he even describes himself as being like a Gnostic monk toiling away before the divine mystery with all his 20 screens and his Levi Strauss and his whatever it is, you know, he's just looking at ads and in this kind of Burroughs cut up multi-screen way, trying to read the world. And, and, and he hopes, or less Burroughs than, than Benjamin, again, he hopes that all the dots, all the, all the black dots will one day join up into a beautiful constellation and that will be it. That will be the moment of knowledge, which will be a revolutionary, politically revolutionary as well. And it never comes, but he's in a kind of holding pattern. He, he gets obsessed with the buffering sign. Right. He thinks if only that buffering ends, then I'll, be, then I'll get it. And of course it never ends. But, but as long as this buffering, that this hope, you know, we're being held in that. I think Kafka talks about being, being in a holding pattern around truth. And he, he's in this kind of holding pattern without ever being called in. The thing about, um, about the mystic encounter is that it's not a knowledge-based encounter. It's a body-based encounter, and an, it's an aesthetic encounter. So another thing that the oil spill makes me think about is, 
you know, it's, it's beyond horror, and the way that you, the character, experiences it is really on an aesthetic level. He, he becomes unambiguously completely, says, it's beautiful. He, he really, loves it. He really, really yeah. loves it. And there's this, um, like, the romance versus the horror, um, when I think what he's trying to figure out is something in between, <laughs> right? But I'd, I'm curious about what you think about the non-human being only accessible through aesthetic experience rather than other forms of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, a writer that's really important to me is, is Francis Ponge, this French, um, you know, early to mid 20th century poet who is on the fringes of the Surrealist group and the Document group, who also, by the way, did films of octopuses, Jean Pan Levé. Um, but he writes uh, just about basic objects like an orange or an oyster or a cigarette. And what's interesting in his prose poems are that, is that he doesn't actually describe the objects, he describes the failure to describe the objects because they are just so weird. Like, and he talks about an orange, if you try and express it, which has the double sense of like, put it in a poem or a painting, but also e express, squeeze it to get its essence out. You can't, I mean, it kind of collapses and you get gunk all over your hands and then it kind of bounces back and you've got the husk of an orange and what are you gonna do with that? And then what's the poem? You know, is the, the poem is, is like that, that kind of, whatever, it's like a car crash between, <laughs> it's, it, it's always a failure. He talks about a, a premature expulsion of seeds, you know, uh, it's, it's an erotic and an aesthetic and an intellectual failure. And, and, and his idea of literature is that it should somehow, act, you know, again, it's anti-idealist, rather than capture the orange and make it an object of thought, it should just produce orange mess and poet mess and language mess. So, so, so there's, you know, neither the human wins nor the object. There's, there's some kind of interzone or in between, no man's land between the two. That 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 is where maybe the literature is happening. Do you want to talk about the kachuk? Oh yeah, the kachuk. This is something else that my guy gets obsessed with. Um, in the anthropology museum in in Frankfurt, he sees this um, kachuk, which is rubber in its raw form. And rubber, of course, makes everything from you know, the chairs we're sitting on, to the clothes we're wearing, to the buildings we live in, and airplanes and cars. But in its raw form, it's this kind of tumorous, bulbous... Like abject. Substance. Abject, sub exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and I was thinking a lot of, of, of one of the other document members, Georges Bataille, his idea of the formless, which is kind of central. Yeah, we have the quote. <laughs> is someone going to read it? <laughs> someone want to read it? If Do you want to read it? <laughs> I guess, yes, formless. A dictionary would begin as of the moment when it no longer provided the meanings of words but their tasks. In this way, formless is not only an adjective having a given meaning, but a term that serves to bring things down, déclassé, in a word that generally requires that each thing have its form. What this word designates has no rights in any sense and gets itself squashed everywhere, like a spider or an earthworm, or I guess an orange. In fact, for academic men to be happy, the universe would have to take shape. All of philosophy has no other goal. It is a matter of giving a frock coat to what is a mathematical frock coat. On the other hand, affirming that the universe resembles nothing and is only formless amounts to saying that the universe is something like a spider or spit. So again, we end up in knowing all or knowing nothing and neither one being the right thing. I, I just think this is such a good... Um evocation of the idea of matter just as, as being the, the most radical form of resistance to, to interpretation, to reason, to totality, to, to the kind of project of, 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 of anthropology, of, of, of colonial conquest of the alien, even if the alien's us, you know, which of mastery. Of enlightenment knowledge. Which, yeah, which is the project of the enlightenment. Yeah. yeah, so matter, I think elsewhere Bataille says, the only way I can define matter is, is that it represents, in relation to the economy of the universe, what crime represents in relation to the law. It's this unsolvable, primal um, crime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, in that sense, um, to write realism, or realism as such, this, this sort of helps set up a way of talking about what realism as a literary convention is, 
and how um, at one point you mentioned in an essay that the real is like a black hole and that trying to write the real well is like almost a joke in regard to the black hole that is the real of signification. Um, it can't be revealed by pinning it down. It can only be revealed by um, knowing that you're always approaching the black hole and continuing to approach it. Yeah, well, I guess in that essay, I tried to kind of tease out the difference between realism, which is just a literary convention, which is as artificial as any other literary convention, right? We don't walk down the street going, as I walk down the street, comma, I contemplate you know, it's, it's not like that. You know, it's, it's as, as Burroughs says, you know, you, you see a sign go by, you have some words, you see a color, that you have half a conversation. I mean, a Gertrude Stein poem is a more realistic description than a, than a Dickens paragraph of what it, what it is just to, to be in the world. So, okay, that's realism. Then you've got reality. I mean, what's that? You know, <laughs> I mean, Ballard says that um, in the introduction to Crash that you know, we, we live inside a giant novel. The, the fiction's already there. The writer's task is to invent the reality. And then there's the real, which would be, that's the one I'm really interested in. And that, I think that can only be understood in a kind of traumatic way. I mean, Lacan gets it, right? For him, the, the real is, is, it's not something that's realistic or empirically truly naming something. It's this trauma, it's a punctum at which the fabric rips. And, and, and it's got nothing to do with authenticity or any of that crap, it, it, it's something, it's like a black hole. It's, it's a point of collapse and a point that, that we're always kind of skirting around. Is there any way to encounter the black hole that is not simply a trauma? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and, yeah. what's, and what's interesting about, you know, when we talk about realist fiction, we kind of, you know, the straw man we often have in mind is the kind of contemporary middle brow novel, which is an easy target. But if you actually look at the, the good realist fiction, you know, the founders of realism in fiction, Flaubert, Balzac, they totally understand this. Then actually not realists at all. They understand that it's code on code, convention on convention, and they delight in just finding the one bolt that if you slightly undo it, the whole edifice comes tumbling down. So. You know, Balzac writes Saracene, which is about an artist that copies the perfect woman, but it turns out the, this woman is actually, and here's where queerness comes in, the woman is actually a castrato, so he's copying a copy of a copy of a copy. Or, or in, in Flaubert's um, Bouvard and Pécuchet, it's about these two guys that try and live an authentic life by reading books about how to be authentic and, and then reenacting even the book covers and the illustrations in this hall to, like Don Quixote, same thing this faltering attempt to be real. So they don't, you know, they completely understand that it's, it's a void, you know, but beneath, beneath the, the edifice is, is, beneath the carpet is just an abyss. Right, and this, uh, at the risk of going back to the Middle Ages one more time, uh, this uh, makes me think of the two traditional ways of writing mystical texts, one of which is apophasis, which is the descending assertions, which is uh, God is the absence of light, God is the absence of air, God is the absence of sun, all these things that God is not. And the other one is cataphasis, which is descending assertions, which is God is light, God is sun. And there, there are two ways of getting to the black hole. One is taking everything away and into infinity, and the other is adding attributes up into infinity. Right, so infinite accumulation versus infinite reduction as two rhetorical strategies trying to get to the divine or the unknowable. And I feel like a lot of what you is doing in this book is trying to approach this totally formless real um, by first describing it in as many ways as possible and then sort of facing this impossibility and then stripping away and stripping away and stripping away and then he ends up in a buffering zone, in a holding tank. He ends up literally waiting for a ferry, for the Staten Island Ferry, which is like the Karen Ferry to death, which is the suburbs, you know. Um, but he doesn't take it. He, he stays in the, in the holding pattern, and he goes back, in, back into the city. And I was actually talking of Balzac. I was, it's a kind of rip-off, basically, of the end of, of um, Le Père Goriot, where the hero does exactly that. He goes back into the machine, back into the... It's very taken by the idea of the bug, the bug in the system, you know, being the insect, but also the glitch, the glitch in the matrix. I mean, the, 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 he, he goes back to kind of work in the machinery, but he's also the thing that might, that might bring it down 
one day if the conditions are right, but not now. They'll never be right, but the possibility, the potential is there. You know, it's political ultimately. I guess this is a political. You know, this this becomes a. He's trying to map capitalism, and he's trying to bring it crashing down. And then he realizes at the same time this is a bourgeois fantasy. His girlfriend says to him, "It's like a James Bond fantasy. You just want to blow up the factory, but the factory is already blowing itself up. You know, it doesn't take terrorists to to make nuclear power plants. You know, it doesn't take hackers to make." automated trading systems crash, they do it on their own. Right, um, and it doesn't take the realist writer to reveal reality through realism. Neither, neither. Right, yeah, like exactly. the reveal won't work, neither will the implosion or the explosion. Yes, th th this, this, this is true. But I guess what the writer can do is, is a kind of mapping, mm -hmm. a kind of cognitive, this is what Yu's doing. And this is back to, you know, Theseus in the labyrinth. He's just, he's not gonna kill the Minotaur, but there's a, there's a kind of mapping of networks, and I think that itself is a political act and an aesthetic act. You know, I mean, the world is weird, but, but you can map the weirdness. That, that weirdness has nodes, and, and they have a particular configuration. And, and as an artist, you can kind of, it's what, it's, I, it's what I really admire in someone like Tr Trevor Paglin, for example. I think he's doing that very well. Just a kind of mapping of the nodes of the weird the weird black boxes that we're living inside and outside and you know, eating and being eaten by every day. <laughs> well, that's an ideal moment to start a broader discussion. Um, if um, Alison and Jim, do you wanna join us? And we will um, let people ask us questions. Hey, um, I have a question for Tom McCarthy. Um, why did you choose to, I haven't read your books, sorry, but why did you choose to um, write from the perspective of a classical anthropologist? Um, because instead of a, an anthropologist from the new school, um, because um, I'm assuming that your, your worlds are set in a contemporary context where um, the ideas of hybridization are more prevalent and um, to me it seems like this idea of a, of a old school kind of rigid anthropologist who has this very defined boundary between self and other uh, would be, yeah, I'm just curious about this choice. I, I guess I wanted to kind of take a, a classical model of the anthropologist or, or the novelist, which I think is still the kind of default popular kind of imagined model and just crash it against super modernity um, and, and see, what, see what happened. I mean, if you take someone that's already super modern, then there's no, there's no, there's no um, drama, right? I mean, he'd, he'd get it, he'd just go, yeah, sure, well, you know. I mean, so, so, it, so I think, you know, I, I think that, that was the kind of, um, the, the dramatic, um, Gesture, gesture, conflict. Jim, what do you think about the anthropologist as a figure given the first contact expertise that you have? Well, we see it fictionalized quite a lot and usually quite badly. I mean, most recently, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the movie, but where it was linguists, you know, will for- oh, With aliens. Yeah, yeah. Ar arrival. I mean, classical anthropology was, as you, as you point out, all about first contact and I think it, it sometimes gets it, it's interesting to go and look back at some of those classical anthropological texts and see how wrong they got things. Um, this, this kind of stuff gets heavily satirized by people like Chinua Achebe, where we have this amazing narrative of a, a man's life in Things Fall Apart, and then there's a coda right at the end about how some British functionary comes along and writes a little paragraph about it in an anthropological manner, and that becomes the official record. Um, so I think we, we live in a, 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 again, a dream maybe, that we can map these things, that our systems will adequately explain them, um, and that there's a, there's a perpetual gap between the official records we leave and the, rea and the, the real, and the, and the actual experiences that were encountered, and maybe that gap is the weird. Right, but this, this reminds me, Alison, of your point um, about the weird residing within the body, which suggests that some kinds of experience can't be transmitted through language, right? So certain kinds of knowledge maybe can't be codified according to a paragraph at all. 
Yeah, I mean, this is um, certainly one of the things, I mean, I can't speak for kind of queer experience across the board, but certainly I think like um, a lot of queer thought has um, kind of importantly destabilized structures of desire, right? That this isn't actually a thing that is, um, that we want to kind of map out, that is that wants to be explained necessarily. Um, and so that to me seems to share a lot with kind of with weird methods or weird methodology in that way. So yeah, the gaps are super important and worth kind of reveling in. Is it worth trying to transmit or does that defeat it? Transmit meaning? Um, meaning experience on the level of sensation or maybe even aesthetic. The gap itself? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so. I don't know what that looks like, but I think so. Yeah, it's very powerfully suggestive. I, I know what it, I, here's what it might look like. Yeah. Well, there's another thing I love about Levi, Levi is this on, about Levi Strauss is um, there's this moment where he's basically going mad in, in a village in the jungle and he's, the next boat out isn't for another three months and he's just really bored. And he... Um, and on one side of his paper, he's got all these notes, scientific notes about the language and the hut layout and the tattoos and the belief systems. And then he turns the pages over and says, screw this, I'm going to write an epic play like Racine. And he starts writing an epic drama, which is stupid. And like after another week, he gets bored of that. But if you imagine that piece of paper, right, on one side, they're both attempts to map. On one side, you get kind of science. And then on the other side, you'd get epic art. And both of these are kind of unicorns. They're mirages. They're like impossibilities. But in the middle, if you could actually blow that paper up with a m microscope, you'd get this pulpy mush with black ink inside it. And I think that, that's the truth. I mean, that's, that's the space of literature. It's, it's right. matter. Well, what's, it's the what's, material map. What, yeah. What's really interesting... Which about, can't be read. Yeah. What's really interesting about that play that... Levi Strauss tried and failed to write is it's about the deification of the Emperor Augustus. It's about uh, a man on the cusp of becoming a god. So it's perichoretic as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm thinking of the new weird as a sort of criticism of the old weird, like in the way that you can say that any criticism is imminent cr criticism or we hope for it to be. And I just wonder if at any point in any of your practices, you are concerned with creating new metaphors. Because we have the black hole, we have first contact, we have, I mean, I could go on, right? But so I wonder if in any of your practices, this is a concern at all, or if this could be a concern for the writer, even in the new weird. I mean, I can just start, uh, but uh, so, so one of the kind of quick things that I, um, I don't know if it directly answers your question, but um, is that this uh, theorizing of something like what a weird method might look like would be to read very much against metaphor. I don't know like exactly how to do that or what that might mean, but to, to, to think about encountering literary texts and kind of in some way that resists m metaphorizing um, in some way. So, I mean, in that aspect, I guess I'm, um, I, I feel like invested in kind of um, in the way that the weird or weirdness might resist or refuse this, um, but I also don't know how to fully get away from it, I guess. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about the new weird is, and it's probably got a lineage here going back to the counterculture, and especially, as, as you were saying, William Burroughs, is its use of drug narratives, you know, fiction by Jeff Vert, or sorry, Jeff Noon's Vert, or um, Steph Swainston's work, where um, somebody in the throes of a drug experience ceases to understand which is the reality. Have I, have I gone out into a drug ontology, or have I left, uh, you know, something that was weird and entered actual reality? And we, and we get this in, with Jant's sort of dimension shifting. He takes a drug that literally throws himself into another universe. So. Um, I think maybe we start looking at metaphor on the level of ontology itself. You know, if we're still living in a world, I mean, not to beat, the, beat this to death, but if we're living in a world where we think we can continue forever in a petro-enabled culture, um, we're going to find ourselves thrown into a very different reality very shortly. Um, and then which is, which is like and which is unlike? Which is metaphor? Yeah, I'd, I guess I'd be kind of against... I don't know about the new weird, but I'd be against metaphor. I mean, the writers I really ad admire, I don't think, you know, Kafka's work isn't metaphorical. I mean, the, the Beatle isn't a metaphor for something else. 
you know, and the whale and Moby Dick isn't a metaphor, for, or, or the shark and Jaws for that matter. It's not, it's not directly translatable. I mean, it could be translated 10 different ways, but it's still just this massive lump of threatening matter. And, and I guess maybe I'm in this more like Deleuzean kind of way into assemblages more than metaphors. And for me, I mean, the, the ultimate assemblage for Saturn Island is, is the buffering situation. You know, you're on your laptop, you're trying to do whatever it is buy that airline ticket and it buffers and you're going, come on, come on, you know, and you know the price is going up massively every minute. But there's this implicit reassurance, like, don't worry, we've got you. You know, there are data angels hovering around your Wi-Fi connection you are taken care of. But then you kind of think, what if there isn't? What if it's just like a stupid circle? <laughs> you know, <laughs> there is nothing. I mean, so that, that would, that's not a metaphor, that, that's an assemblage. And I think lots of the stuff you're talking about and, and lots of the stuff I love too, which sometimes overlaps. Well, Morozov talks more about, about this a lot, about the, the, the delusion we live in, that big data will save us, in fact, that it will entrap us, yeah. as we're seeing with things like Facebook and the NSA and so on. I think what has always been most exciting to me about science genre fiction, say science fiction, is that it doesn't operate on the level of metaphor. It's not a spaceship that is a metaphor for travel, it's a spaceship. And I like that literality, that extreme literality so much because it resists decoding meaning. It's a spaceship, right? It's a story that's happening in a real spaceship. And you have to get to that level of accepting it on in, you know, this, this, this reality that we begin in in order to approach the story on its own terms, which is the same way I feel, it's a lot harder, but the same way I feel reading medieval literature um, it's not a metaphor of an, a contact with Christ's body. It happened, you know, this, it's not a metaphor for God, it's God. And that is so bizarre for me. That's really, I mean, what could, the literality of that encounter is totally shocking to me. Um, and I think that is totally resistant to any kind of decoding of the symbolic on the, that operates on the figurative level of metaphors. It's the one thing I love about Catholicism, the only thing I love about Catholicism is, is the fact, you know, it's not a metaphor. You are literally cannibalizing Christ's body. That is Christ. You're eating you know, him it's not, it's not every a symbol. time. Yeah. <laughs> um, just because you were speaking about resisting uh, decoding, I guess this is a, a question especially for the, for the academics because academia is really about kind of um, like definition and like utility in a way and that, like this sort of, I think this is a little bit what happened to queer as a term, that it was like supposed to be this thing that resisted categorization and then it was completely burdened by categorization and, and how to kind of like, I guess in your work, Alison, kind of approach this, like not, like not trying to kind of make, a, like make weird politically useful necessarily or like, or like, what, like what kind of challenges that brings. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I sort of alluded to this quickly in, in my talk when I said that, um, you know, queer has become a method so rampant, much to queer theorists, I think, dismay, or what it had originally kind of um, emerged out of or for or in response to or to provide some something else, right? And so, um, so yeah, you know, I guess, I guess what, so I should say two things. It seems probably on one hand that I'm kind of, I am kind of attempting to define the weird, right? Like here's um, a series of, of ways that we might think about the weird. But I mean, I feel like, um, and I think Tom also alluded to this, that you also see that this becomes so totally unwieldy so quickly. Like what suddenly, what, what is not weird, right? What is not weird about the human? Um, and so, you know, for me, I think the weird kind of retains or um, recalls some of the things that were also exciting about queerness and, and the idea of the queer in its earlier phases, right? That, like, there's, there's a way that the weird will not uh, be categorizable, I don't think, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, the, the ac academics are absolutely stone-cold guilty of over-taxonomizing. This is what they like to do. Um, they like to take concepts and ideas and, and, and pin them to boards like people in the 19th century used to do with butterflies. Um, I, I think where I see a parallel between the queer and the weird, other than the, the, the overlap that, that, that Ali's been examining, is in that they both function initially as outsider ontologies, um, as non-mainstream uh, modes of existence and modes of thinking and modes of conceptualization. Um, possibly 
what happens then is that academia comes along, tries to codify these things, and they've, they've maybe largely done it with the concept of, of queerness, but um, you know that process is still ongoing with the weird, and maybe we'll actually find that the weird is very heavily resistant to it, partly because the weird is everywhere. Yeah, I would just say, like, in, you know, in a system of recuperative capitalism, it's not like any concept will ever not be recuperated the minute it's, before it's a concept. Like, it will, that, probably it's invented already. I mean, when you get into the idea of hyperstition or that, you know, fiction and reality are in this weird feedback loop, which is very true in cycles of consumer capitalism, right? And just thinking about the financial market as a fiction that is always inventing itself and predicting the future. So I have like no good answer. I don't, I don't know, I don't know if anything is resistant. I almost like don't even wanna, like that's not almost like something I could hope for. <laughs> yeah, but, but this comes back to the question, maybe this is broadening it out of it, but it comes back to the question of the outside because you know, just as like for Derrida, there is no outside the text. You know, there's kind of no outside. I, I, I think I think it's important to realize there is no outside to um, the the system of of being in the world and being in history and being in power and being in money and and you know and, and I think political agency begins when you understand your your embeddedness. And if there's one massive critique I'd make of the situationists for all their brilliant conceptualizations is that they did over by this fantasy of the out, you know, I'm outside, you're recuperated, I'm not. And you just end up denouncing all your friends then shooting yourself if you take that position. It's not, it's not very productive. Well, that would be the counter, the, the structural problem with the counterculture probably throughout the last decades anyway. So I wouldn't say weird is meant to be like a counterculture. That seems like the wrong setup. Um, if I were a structural anthropologist, I would deny that one. Just to follow up from what Tom was just saying, um, I mean, but what about against this idea that there's no outside, this sense that I think a lot of people share that like Trump and Brexit kind of were symptoms of this great rupture in our reality model, that that wasn't so easy to recuperate into this, this sort of existing system, but did actually mark a break and a great weirding of the assumed reality base that we were all living in. But, but that, that's an outside that's on the inside, right? I mean, it's like, you know, the zombies in the citadel, they're not, they're not outside, they're, you know, the, the outside is not outside, it's, it, it's in. Again, yes. think of all the, these Derridian constructs, like, you know, in, internal vomiting, or, or the, the forum, which is the outside, which is the inside, or, or the symptom in psychoanalytic tradition, which is the same, it's the alien inside you. I, I just think, you, you know, I mean, this, this idea of a, I mean, borders are important, you know, think of someone like Chris Deva and the abject, you know, borders are important, but they're always porous and you can prod them and they break. And, and yeah, as know. also then when in the sort of everyone doing ayahuasca and like wanting to look at these different ways of interpreting reality, I think you could see it like that. We were, we were talking actually earlier before the event began about how badly the Matrix is glitching these days. I mean, I, I date it back to when Leicester City won the English soccer premiership, which is, it was so un unbelievably plausible it made Brexit and Trump's election look entirely legitimate. Um, but I, I guess I sort of agree with Richard Rorty when he says that, you know, we have, because of the provisionality of the scientific method, because it always says, I, we don't know everything yet, we're still working on it, it's a method, not a totalizing um, ideology. Um, therefore, we should always pay attention to other ways of understanding knowledge, and maybe that relates to your sort of interest in revelatory uh, mystical experiences and that kind of thing, even if only we do it ironically, because um, that allows us to get outside again, if only temporarily, if only briefly, and try to get a new perspective on what it is before we're, we're hauled back inside. So even if only ironically, like the, there doesn't need to be some kind of like earnest intent, like the experience will... That, that's, his, that's his argument. I mean, I, you know, I've just spent four years looking at Catholicism in relation to science fiction. You know, there was definitely times I was doing that ironically, but also with... <laughs> um, <laughs> there's only so many Jesuits in space you can read before you, you need to go out for a walk and, and smell the flowers. But, um, uh, you know, yes, ironically, but you, you need to understand that 
for any belief system that you can uh, encounter or come up with, including, I found out recently, um, the ancient Egyptian pantheon, there's, there's some people out there believing in this stuff right now. Um, so the outside is inside, but yeah. somewhere, maybe not where you are. Right. It's a bit confused, but um, I'm just putting something on, on the table in a way. Uh, just uh, uh, for me, the weird is new, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> And, um, and uh, I just had a uh, thought, um, because I deal with my work uh, with time a lot, and today I was uh, reading something about the history of a uh, clock, and, uh, and I, have, I, I just have to share this with you, <laughs> because it's really weird. <laughs> so basically, um, you are talking about Middle Age and all this ideas of, uh, well, not ideas, about the literature of dream and, um, and, uh, and you about this reality of the God. And, uh, and we have all learned in the school that uh, Middle Ages is this like black period where um, sort of nothing happened and things were forgotten. Um, and well, it's not true, this never happens, but uh, this is sort of what we are uh, taught. And, um, and today I read about this thing that is pretty uh, <laughs> weird. And it is that uh, basically the one invention that uh, happened in Middle Age is the clock and, the, and, and calendars. A lot of scientific effort, basically all of scientific effort was put in these two things that, um, well, in my thesis nowadays, they really like um, shape how we live. It would not be possible to do anything without a temporal system or uh, nothing. Like every, the whole uh, global world is based on how time has been shaped and made. And I, I think it's a really f uh, funny um, gap. <laughs> to reuse one of your word, uh, um, uh, begrif, uh, the, this, this, this uh, um, uh, this looking into this dream and this, uh, and this uh, complete uh, absurdity of this and the other one, this trying of making such a structure mm -hmm for time or for life or whatever it is. Right. So I, as I say, it's not, really, it's not really clear, but maybe you can start something about it. <laughs> t t time is weird. Time, yeah. time, time might be the ultimate weirdness, um, especially, uh, and you're quite right to point out the invention of the clock in particular and the mechanical clock in the Middle Ages, um, this attempt to empirically pin down time because we all experience time subjectively, and sometimes, like when you're in an exam, time gets really slow. And then at other times, when you're, you're, you're doing something exciting, it becomes very, very fast. And in dream states or hallucinatory states, it becomes enormously subjective. One minute you're a baby, the next minute you're 104. Um, so time is experienced fundamentally subjectively, but not maybe, and this comes back to the communicative issue, not necessarily in a way we can always convey to others. We can't say my time is going slower or faster than yours right now. Um, but it is fundamentally weird, and we, we've agreed, again, this kind of academic way of pinning things down and taxonomizing them, we've agreed that there is a certain, there's 24 hours in a day. We're just chopping up infinity, really. You know, uh, it's just an, it's an agreed fiction, and, and like that thin veneer over the, the much crazier reality, uh, actual time bubbles up out of it every now and again and reminds us how weird it is. Hi. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, this is, might be a little bit of a kind of general open-ended question, but I was wondering if you could touch on like how the new weird intersects with the idea of technology. Um, so uh, one of you said earlier, like brought up the idea of the Burkean sublime, um, but if you kind of like build it back off like um, the like Kantian sublime and then follow it through to like someone like Frederick Jameson who says, that um, the, the postmodern sublime is is kind of located in like financial markets and things like this, like things that we ourselves have created, but uh, are, they're actually way too complicated for us to understand. Um, I know this is something that happens, I think, a few times in, in Tom's novels. 
Um, so in Remainder, uh, I haven't read it for a while, but uh, like an object falls from the sky, hits a guy on the head, he doesn't really have a clue what happens, but he's then on, endowed with like capital, which enables him to kind of, um, yeah, like re recreate events that have this kind of like sublime spiritual quality to them. For me, that's like an archetypally like weird um, experience. And it's something that's even weirder because it comes out of something that like we as human beings created ourselves. I think this um, connects well to the last question. Um, Jameson talks also a lot about um, how at this moment um, our conception of time has kind of collapsed to being singular and body-based because we're struggling so much with futurity and historicity um, and that clock time isn't relevant there, neither is planetary time. How are we uh, experiencing our uh, technologically mediated lives in incremental senses? And it seems like paradoxically it's the opposite. It's like you zoom back into the body and all you have is kind of like your, um, your perception about you. Um, and I think that's, some, yeah, that's something that Jameson talks quite a bit about specifically in relation to the aesthetics of singularity with technology. Um, but. I, I guess in Remainder, he's, he's trying to have these sublime moments of just smelling the smell of liver wafting from another room like Proust in his Madeleine. I mean, it's in a building called Madeleine Mansions. It's kind of it's a bit blatant. Um, but he can never quite get that moment because his staff are cooking so much liver that all this fat cogs up the, the vent and then there's the fat, like literally these mounds of, of fat and then he's getting fat wedged on his fingers. I mean, again, the interruption of the formless abject material. And I mean, the, but I, you know, I keep thinking of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It's all there. You know, there's nothing particularly new about this. I mean, the, the character Frankenstein, the scientist, is trying to have his Caspar David Friedrich moment of standing on the mountaintop, gazing to infinity. And the monster literally blocks his view. And, and what is the monster? I mean, it's capitalism and technology, but it's also just unformed flesh. It's like meatpacking sausage plants, and it's falling apart. It's, it's, it's like this kachuk. So, so I, think, I think that this, this kind of play between the sublime and its material underpinning, which is also its material undoing, it, it's as old as Plato, and it just gets staged in different ways according to the kind of technological interface or software of a particular century. But I don't think the story changes fundamentally. No, it's I love Frankenstein, of Frankenstein on replay. As the, as the singularity, like <laughs> that's what we're heading towards. Well, well, like... we were, I mean, this is what The Tempest's about. Everything we've been talking about is in the, I mean, alien in, count, in cultures, <laughs> race, sex, queerness, uh, capitalism, and fishy weirdness. Mm -hmm. It's all in the Tempest already. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I think with the new weird, I mean, if, if not to get too didactic about it, but if science fiction um, deifies technology, you know, it, it's technophilic, especially in its American form. Uh, it, it, you know, technology will provide the answers to everything and lead us ultimately to a techno utopia. Um, and and if fantasy literature, especially high fantasy, just eschews it, it's just frozen in a perpetual early to middle, middle ages kind of level of technology. You look at Game of Thrones and you think, um, you were able to build an ice wall 8,000 years ago, but nobody's invented a gun yet, you know? Um, you know, so fantasy literature just issues technological development. I think with weird fiction, what we're finding is, it's coming back to that um, fight, flee, or understand paradigm that, that, that Elvie and I have discussed. Um, you know, the, it, it, it is very suspicious of technology. Technology, in other words, doesn't provide the answers. Um, when in, in, in Jeff Vandermeer's Southern Reach trilogy and in Annihilation, when they, they go into, the scientists go into this weird space, all the technology is of no use to them. It can't help them now. They're in a different ontological reality. Um, so I think, I think weird fiction has a different relationship to technology than either science fiction or fantasy in that regard. Yeah, and it's funny because the thing about the film adaptation, one of the critiques was that it wasn't weird enough, and part of that was precisely because um, of those kind of scenes when Natalie Portman, she's the biologist um, in the film, and she like looks into the microphone, and she goes, oh, aha, right? Like, I figured it out, right? And so somehow scientific kind of innovation in the film um, takes precedence, whereas in the novels, it's really kind of refusing that kind of one-to-one -one relationality. 
So first of all, thank you for the discussion. And I have a little problem because I found it quite interesting, but at the end, I don't think I'm any more smarter than I was before, because when it goes to the genres and terms, and that's also my problem when we want to describe exactly this bright spectrum like science fiction or fantasy in the terms of genres. Because from now what I'm heard, from my perspective, is not different from I will describe as a normal science fiction or a fantasy thing. Because when we look uh, at the back, so we can just, we, we have this description with this, what is a science fiction novel and then we, what, is a science, what is a fantasy novel. And for example, you can take like uh, books by Philip K. Dick when we already have got this all description between, okay, what is real, what is not real. We can talk on the books by Science of Land, like Solaris, when we've got already the problem with the communication between people and other alien creatures. Also the mix between science fiction and fantasy had already made George Lucas in the 70s. So <laughs> in some, and my also question is, if the author, if the writers, or the authors themselves would them describe as weird tellers, because in my, from my perspective, maybe I'm just writing most of the things that are weird, uh, new weird, but my problem is I don't see that much the difference. And I, I would say that totally, most of the science fiction and fantasy totally right. is yeah. weird. Right, I would say the best science fiction is not science fiction, the best fantasy isn't fantasy, the best books aren't books, right? Like, the, the taxonomies are, suck. Like, my, my hope would be that we have to use them in order to talk about something else. Um, but Solaris is the weirdest book ever, right? It's called science fiction. What? Solaris is very strange, but it's official. It's as we we right, describe it as a science fiction book. But who's official, right? Like where, like this stuff is use, useful for the market and for academia. No, and, no, no. I, but I'm right. also using uh, why we describe it as new weird. That's, that's we can make it like on the other side. Why we should describe it as a new weird? So, so it's also like an okay, like a new term. And I'm sure that Stanislav then would say it's not science fiction. It's not new weird. It's just a book. Yeah, I think that's also part of what the project of like the program is kind of after is to say like what because partly you know what are the what are the values of the and the, of the parameters of genre itself and how does weirdness kind of work transhistorically work across genres as a kind of concept that is yeah maybe it's ever present maybe it is frustrating precisely because of the reasons that you're describing but it's not just about categorizing which kind of texts are weird and which are science fiction and which are fantasy and which are horror um, for at least in, for me but thinking about weirdness as a kind of concept or mode that that is really kind of mobile across genres it's present in science fictional texts it's present in horror I mean it's present in my work in things that are very ordinary I mean, I, I didn't have time to mention, but I, when I was talking about that sort of lineage of dream narratives that goes all the way back to, to the Romans, frankly, and beyond, um, all the way up through the Middle Ages and into sort of science fiction, um, I, I, I sort of said it sort of stops at, at, at around 1920 uh, with David Lindsay, with, the, with, with a couple of exceptions. One of those is Philip K. Dick. Um, but Philip K. Dick is science fiction because, not just because he affiliated as such, but also because um, the, the nova within his novels are still technological. They're still um, science fictional nova based on plausible extensions of our own technology within the laws of our, our physics that, as we understand them. Um, the, the weird goes beyond that again. I mean, that's not to say that there are, I mean, I agree with Ali. There's, Philip K. Dick is very weird. You know, he's science fictional and he's weird. And I think that's really, um, Mark Bold talks about science fiction as a practice, not a product. And I think it's probably best to think of, of the weird as, as a, an ontology of itself rather than a mode as well. When I can only say one thing about it, what you said, because the problem is also that when we take, for example, Lem, some Lem was self a science. So when he was describing, so Lem was self, an, uh, he was a doctor, so he knew what he was describing. But Dick, he, was, he had no scientific degree. So for me, that's also that's a problem because he, may, he would say, okay, this is like an, uh, okay, this is based on this and this and this and this and this uh, scientific uh, themes, but he made it up. So it's still weird, in my opinion. Fair enough. 
Hi there. Uh, yeah, I work for uh, a body of the EU that deals with climate change, so I was super interested in, in all the climate-related um, topics that were expressed. And so I was wondering if the new weird lend itself to a particular ideology. Um, so just to give context, in the space I work, when, work in, um, we talk a lot about solutions related to anthropocentricism, so innovation in the human realm, um, things like geoengineering, let's say, or carbon capture technologies. Um, on the other hand, we have ecocentricism, so solutions related to planting uh, trillions of trees for um, carbon positive results. Um, so I was wondering how the new weird might fit into that. Um, I, I'm leaning, you know, it's a leading question. I'm leaning a little bit towards ecocentricism with regards to um, an acceptance of the inscrutable, uh, of the way nature works, perhaps not as an ecosystem, but as a, a group of assemblage. Um, and uh, organisms interacting with one another in ways that can't be mapped versus the ways that can. Um. I, I think, um, th does the new weird embody any particular ideology? No. Um, but, for example, this week, Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, who's normally seen as a, a science fiction writer or a climate fiction writer, um, was writing in the Guardian newspaper in Britain, and he, he said something that I thought was weird. Um, he said that one of the the best solutions to trying to get ourselves through the next period of cataclysmic change in relation to the climate as easily as possible would be to remove human beings from half the planet. I move them to, you know, not necessarily like the southern hemisphere or whatever, but basically designate half the planet as human-free zones and move as many people into cities and into other locations as possible in order to let um, the ecology of those places try to bounce back. Now, if we start thinking about the possibility of doing that, in one way, we're harnessing a process that's already been happening for 150 years, which is increased urbanization. We're just trying to manage that process. Um, on another hand, the idea of making half the planet a no-go area for us is really weird. Yeah, do you, think that, that, do you think there's a kind of humility to accepting the new weird, you know, as hu humans? I think, I think in, the, in the same way that there, there, there's a sort of a weird humility in, in how you function in a dream state, you know, constantly shifting ontologies are occurring and you're sort of semi-agential semi and I think that comes back to Mark Fisher and talking about the eerie and agency. You, you, you sort of have agency in a dream but equally you don't. Um, so I, I, I think, yeah, I think, well, we, the climate is going to make us very humble anyway. You know, whether humility, you know, is something that we embody now or have forced upon us is another matter. Um, I have a question Hi. since you already mentioned the annihilation adaption from, I don't know, a few years back, I think. Um, I was wondering if, <clears throat> sorry, if you uh, think or if you feel like there's tendencies in uh, moving images in cinema as well as in literature concerning the whole idea of new weird, because I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to like get into that topic because I'm writing a thesis about it and I've literally found out about New Weird a month ago, so I'm a total noob on that. But um, whenever you try to research movies that are connected with the New Weird, it's only uh, Annihilation comes up and then there's suggestions that um, Guillermo del Toro's uh, Pan's Labyrinth is kind of like in that section. But I was wondering if you have any like associations with that or ideas or if you feel like that even makes sense to you know connect literature with moving images in general i don't work much on cinema so i'm i don't really i don't really know maybe the others have some ide other ideas but i do think there's something like very much valuable about e examining the kind of visuality of the weird and that it allows you access to a lot of maybe different kinds of things that that the text might not and so to me it seems like a really good project but i don't know of kind of new weird cinema, some people have, um, yeah, yeah, I don't even want to venture to say, but I don't know if you guys... Maybe rather than looking for a set of movies that fit the theme, just look for weird elements in every movie, <laughs> right? Rather than looking for like weird, weird books, like sort of, I feel like part of what Allison's project is, is digging back into some of these um, early 20th century books by women and saying, look, these are really really weird according to the working definition of the term. So it might be more like hunting out what exists rather than trying to create a new genre. Yeah, but the adaptation is an interesting point, right? Because it, it does, it makes some very interesting decisions about the kind of ways that, um, so for, for 
the novel Annihilation, right? There's this kind of area X that has no clear boundaries or borders, and so, and the film, and so we don't know what that kind of looks like, and no one seems to, you know, there's really no description, but in the film, it's just depicted as this kind of giant wall of what looks like a kind of sheer oil, wall of oil or something, swirling oil or shimmer. It's called the shimmer, but it looks very much like a kind of wall of petroleum of, of some sort. So it does different things that are, you know, th that seem worth exploring, but yeah. I mean, I mean, I would think, yeah, working again on, on this sort of idea that, that the weird is an ontology rather than, you know, something that's easily academically codified, although I wish you luck in doing so. Um, you know, and, and, and maybe you're ahead of the curve here. You're going to be the person who, who's able to, to identify a body of, of cinematic texts which, 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 fu which function in a weird way. So going back to the sort of the intersection again with science fiction, some of, some of Stanley Kubrick's movies seem to me to be profoundly weird, um, 2001 in particular. Um, most of Tarkovsky would be weird. Yeah, mo most of Tarkovsky. You know, so there's, there, there, there's going to be overlaps where when you think of where weird came from, it, it came as a pulp fiction genre at the same time as fantasy, at the same time as science fiction, and it still has relations with those cousins. Um, so if you look in Fantastica in general in the cinema, you will find the weird somewhere. Okay, I think that's, um, we've, exhausted, we've exhausted the word weird, so I think we'll stop. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you everyone for staying so late, and thank you, three of you.